Good morning. Good morning. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Welcome this beautiful morning as we gather here in the beauty of the sanctuary on this sunny day uh, to worship God on this Trinity Sunday, uh, the day that we recognize God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want to welcome those of you here in person and those of you joining us at home. Uh, it is a pleasure to be together uh, whatever way we can. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Our first scripture reading comes from Psalm 29. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings, ascribe to the, the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory of his name. Worship the Lord in holy splendor. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord over mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord flashes forth flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord causes the oaks to whirl and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all say glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace. Our Gospel reading comes from John chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. <clears throat> now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, 
Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So we are here on, according to the church calendar, what is called Trinity Sunday, the day that we recognize and set aside to describe God as best as we can describe God uh, and the way that Jesus describes God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Even though you will not find the word Trinity anywhere in Scripture, the Israelites were radically monotheistic. They believed in one God. There's all these other gods out there. And yet Jesus tells His disciples to go baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it creates for us mortal beings this very difficult math problem where one plus one plus one equals one. If you try putting that on your math test in elementary school, you will get the answer wrong. But if you do it in church, you're right. Why is that? It's because the rules of creation do not apply to God. Remember, God was the one who made the rules. God was the one who made creation. And in many ways, we need reminders like we got in Psalm 29 of just who this God is. This God is so huge, so wonderful, so amazing, so terrifying that trees split at the sound of God's voice. That God's voice is over the water and the glory of God thunders over the mighty waters. You see, God's chosen people had a very good understanding of the majesty and holiness of God. Remember, as Moses ascended Mount Sinai to receive the the covenant, the Ten Commandments, Mount Sinai was covered with smoke and there was thunder and lightning and the people at the base were afraid. Moses saw just the hem of God's robe and was turned white 
so white, so radiant that people couldn't even stand to look at Moses and all Moses was doing was barely reflecting the glory of God. God is that other, that wonderful, that amazing. And we try to put that God into a box and understand God. And the boxes just do not fit. None of them are big enough. There must be some way for us finite beings to understand an infinite God. And so God comes in the flesh. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The Son Jesus Christ. And if it were not for Jesus, we would not know the height and depth and breadth of God's love. For in this one statement in John 3.16, Jesus, whoops, I almost used God interchangeably. That was not on purpose. Jesus says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only Son so that everyone who believes in Him may not perish but may have eternal life. I remember the first day that I held Joel in my arms, December 6, 2001. I remember holding him and thinking of this verse. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. And here I am standing there holding my only Son. And I'm realizing just how far God's love goes because I'm not giving my Son for anybody. Saint or sinner? Nope, not going to happen. And yet God would give His Son for everyone, saint and sinner alike, for those who would love God in return and those who would spit in God's face. God gave His only Son for all. The Trinity is ultimately a mystery. I took a class in seminary on the theology of the Trinity, and I have to admit that I was quite afraid when I walked out of the bookstore because I walked away with a stack of books this high, and my wallet was several hundred dollars lighter, and I realized how on how am I ever going to get through all of this in one semester? And in the first class, my professor, Mark Ochtemeyer, asked us if we were just a little bit surprised by the reading, the amount of reading for this class, and we all chuckled and rolled our eyes. And he said, friends, this is only the tip of the iceberg. More ink has been spilled in trying to describe who God is than any other subject. And yet all the ink and all the paper in the world, all of the books, all of the theologians gathered together in one place still struggle to describe an indescribable God. And yet God chooses to humble Himself and come to us taking the form of a servant, taking on flesh. The eternal God steps into time 
so that we can understand. And His name is Jesus. It's much easier to understand God through Jesus. If we want to know how God loves, we look at Jesus. If we want to know how God deals with us, look at Jesus. If we're looking for an angry and vengeful God who's going to zap the sinners... Look at Jesus who reminds the crowds who have brought a sinner to Him that the one who is without sin should cast the first stone. If we want to know just how good God's promise of eternal life is, look at Jesus hanging on the cross and telling the criminal next to Him, that today He will truly be with Him in paradise. Look at Jesus Himself hanging on the cross, praying for the people who are killing Him. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. You see, in Jesus Christ, we take the God of thunder and amazement and whirlwind and we give that God flesh so that we can interact and understand at least maybe a little so that we could be in the presence of the Word made flesh and not be bleached white and radiant so that no one around us could see us or stand to be around us. And God's plan for revealing God's self was perfect. Because God steps into time in the finite, in the flesh, in the body of Jesus Christ, God steps into time He lives a life just like we live a life. He eats, He talks to His friends, He jokes, He has a good time, He cries, and He dies. But unlike us, at least before, He's raised from the dead. And He ascends into heaven. They see Him take His body with Him into heaven right in front of their very eyes. There's the indescribable God again showing God's face. And last Sunday we celebrated the joy of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit is let loose on creation and all of a sudden these backwoods Galilean fishermen and tax collectors, all of a sudden they can speak in the languages of all who are gathered there. And the good news is proclaimed in Jesus Christ that God's love is for all. That Holy Spirit is just as much God as the Father is, as the Son is. That Holy Spirit is God's presence with us now and always. Jesus told His disciples at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew, He said, and remember, I am with you even to the end of the age. That is His Spirit. And His Spirit is here in this place, let loose. Now if God is so wonderful and amazing to be described as lightning and thunder and great winds, God's Spirit is just as uncontrollable as God is. All of that ink that was used in those books for my seminary class 
could not describe God. God is that wonderful and that amazing. If you ever hear a preacher, including myself, stand up here in the pulpit and say, I can describe all of God to you, don't listen to them or listen to me. Because God refuses time and time again to fit into our boxes. And let me tell you why this is a good thing. Because there may come a time in your life, or you may have already been there, where you feel that there is no more hope. You cannot find hope in here. And you cannot see it anywhere around you. God has it. God is infinite. And the strength and power that God has to give us hope through His Spirit and in His Son, Jesus Christ, is without limit. If you find yourself staring down an illness that may very well force you to confront your mortality, that death itself is just a few steps away, leaving behind everything that we know and going into what is unknown, And fear creeps in. God has been there. His Son has been there. And God refuses again to fit into our boxes. And when fear seems to overwhelm, God's strength is there even more. Are you seeing the benefits of having a huge, uncontrollable, wieldy, wild God? It's actually a good thing. Because I don't have to lean upon myself and my strength to get by. I don't even have to lean upon my knowledge. I can trust that this God who created us in God's image has a plan for us. And that that plan is good. It may not be easy. It may not be fun. It may even cost us everything. But God's faithfulness is eternal. So no matter what box we try to put God in, He never fits. And friends, this is good news. Because whatever problem we have, God is eternally bigger than that problem. And we give God the glory and praise To the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in the affirmation of faith as is printed in the bulletin. This is the good news that we have received in which we stand and by which we are saved, if we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day, and that He appeared first to the women, then to Peter and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. 
He is our Lord and our God. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord God make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord God look upon you with favor and grant you peace, now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen.